Our worship on the screen. We got a rock star preacher who won't wake us from our dreams. We want our blessings in our pocket. We keep our missions overseas. But for the hurting in our city, would we even cross the street? But we want to see the I'm 
set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. One, two, one, two, testing. Hello. Good morning to you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us. That didn't sound very convincing. Am I on my? Yeah, hey, there we go. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us and be glad in it. Amen. There you go. I knew you were out there. I could hear you breathing. All right. Welcome into worship today. My name is David Willis, and you have stumbled uh, either quite innocently or purposely into our uh, contemporary worship service here at Forest Park. It's my privilege to be the pastor here. We welcome you, whether you are here in the sanctuary or whether you are watching online. Excited to have you today. Uh, if you're watching online and you would like to have one of our bulletins, go to our webpage, fpumc.org, like Forest Park United Methodist Church fpumc.org navigate to the bottom of the page you click on a link there and you'll find a bulletin or 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 if you are tech phone savvy uh is that right phone t tech phone t um yeah if you got a smartphone and you know how to use it how about that if you got a smartphone and you know how to use it you can go to your store your app store uh download tithe.ly t-i-t-h-e dot l-y app and when you do that, look for Forest Park United Methodist Church in Panama City, Florida, and download our app to your smartphone, and you'll have not only a bulletin, but a whole bunch of other things that go along with the church. Thanks again for being with us today. If you're here with us in the sanctuary, welcome. If you're visiting, we extend warm Christian greetings to you. We want to take just a couple of moments before we move into worship to cover a few announcements. I'm not going to go over them all because they are in your bulletin, and you can read those at your convenience. Got a call church conference coming up. Uh, we extend our deep sympathy to Tina Barron on the passing of her brother John. I um, want to remind you of the Honduras mission trip coming up. We extend congratulations to James and Lisa Johnson on the birth of their first grandchild. Layla Nicole Johnson was born December 16th. I want to take time to remind you that we've got uh, Wednesday night dinners uh, that have resumed. We've got herb baked chicken and all the fixings coming up Wednesday. Sign up for that. In your bulletin today, you should find a couple of things that are very important. First is this, this connection card. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. Take that off the end of your bulletin, fill it out, drop it in the offering plate as it comes around, or in one of the white 
baskets that you see as you exit the sanctuary today. Then in your bulletin today, you'll find something that looks like this. This is uh, responsive, uh, well, I should say it's a, a, a welcoming of Pat Ahern and Jean Bagwell into membership here in the church. They have chosen to come forward and take the membership vows of the church. Uh, and we will welcome them today before we move into the sermon. Having said that, we want to take time to welcome Jamie Clark and to welcome Keith and Chris Barnes as members of Forest Park. Uh, they come by transfer from other Methodist churches, so welcome them when you see them. And a uh, warm welcome to you. Thanks again for being with us today. Let's take time to pray before we worship. Bow with me. God of grace and God of glory, as the old song goes. You are our hope. You are our inspiration. You're our redemption. You are the one who has given us life, hope, and a second chance. We thank you so much for being exactly who you tell us that you are. We love your word. We love to worship you. And as we come together today, it's our prayer that all of those things that separate us would now fall by the wayside. And that for these next few moments, we're together not just with each other, but with you that we could turn our full attention to worshiping, to learning, to fellowship. That when we leave this place today, we would leave changed, knowing we're a bit more like you, knowing that we are going into the world with mission to help other people understand the truth of who you are. So God, do this now supernaturally through this worship. Inhabit our worship and praise. And let us leave revived. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Stand together and worship. Thanks for being with us. Pastor went shopping. Doesn't he look snazzy? <laughs> oh, we, no, I didn't say nothing. You go back there to the back. I, snazzy honestly, looking. Snazzy I said you went looking? shopping. You look snazzy. Hey, I went to Las Vegas. You, so, uh, that's yeah, true. There you go. That's true. I'm so glad to see you this morning. Let's just praise our Father. <laughs>
Father, we just want to hear from you. We know you're real, but we want to feel you. We know you're real. Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for this moment in your presence that we just get to stand before you and honor the things that you've done in the past, honor the things that we know you're gonna do in the future. Trust you, Father. Help us this year to be a year that we, we just, our roots grow deeper, our faith gets so much more deeper in you, Father, that we could care less what happens tomorrow because we know, you know what's gonna happen already. Father, it's hard because we learn those lessons in the seasons that are most devastating. But the sad seasons, and the hard seasons, Father, you're the one who comes in and you renew and you cleanse. So help our eyes to be on you because we can't help that things are going to get cruddy sometime. But Father, you can bring goodness out of those ugly, cruddy situations. So as we continue to come together, Lord, this morning and just lay it all before you, we all have something. Lord, if there's somebody in this room who doesn't want to feel like, well, I'm, uh, I don't really know what I have. Help them to recognize, maybe that's not pride. Maybe you just need to dig a little deeper with the Lord. Maybe you just need to go to his face and ask him, what are some things that you want to get out of me, Lord? And surrender that because it's a beautiful journey, but it's painful if you don't have him. We love you and we trust you, Lord. And so I shout out your name from the rooftops I proclaim that I am yours I am yours and all
giving up and never running out and never turning back for being that one thing that remains when everything else falls away or gets dark or confusing or scary you are that one thing help us Lord to rest in you to trust you to grow in you
May be seated. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that God, you're a gentleman and you don't barge into our lives unless we ask you to. Thank you, Lord, that you will remain patiently waiting for us to invite you in. But Lord, help the hearts that desire you to come in to be ready when you come in, Father, it's going to change everything for them. You being the center of it changes everything. Lord, I have watched you work wonders in my marriage. I have watched you work wonders with my children. I have watched you do things that on this side of heaven, Lord, don't make sense. And I praise you praise you, Father, for the hardships because they have brought me so much closer to you. But Lord, you wait until we ask. Even if we have have had a relationship with you since we were children, you don't barge in further than we want you to barge in. You don't clean house until we ask you to clean house. I pray for hearts in this building today would want to go deeper. Lord, help them to be secure in their walk with you, but help them to desire more, to come in, to clean out, to dust off, to shake things up. Because although it is incredibly uncomfortable for a very short period of time, Lord, what's on the other side of that is miraculous. What's on the other side of that is a actual living, breathing relationship with you. I praise you for it, Lord. I praise you for it, Lord. I praise you for it, Lord, because you did not have to do that for us. You're a God that created us and did not have to make it possible for us to come in your face. But you want that. 
Lord, I pray right now that the bad guy would be the daggum bad guy and that you would receive only glory this morning because you are good and patient and sovereign. Nothing on this earth is better than you, Father. So help our hearts to surrender it to surrender what we think is most important, what we think will get us to the next level, to what we think is best in our career, what we think that we need to do with our giftings, what we think we should do with our children, how we should get involved with our, our grown children, Lord, that we see them falling away. How do we do it, Lord? We don't. We don't. Correct our sight. Correct our point of being here, Father. It is not to go in and clear out other people's cobwebs. Put us back in our place. Help us to have eyes on our own stuff, Father, because that's when things get murky and messed up. Help our eyes to be on our own hearts and surrender it to you. Lord, I desire deeper and more and more, but I know it's not gonna be comfortable. So I pray for you to come alongside us, come alongside our church. There's so much changing, Lord, and we just trust you. We don't have to worry. Your plan will be better than anything we can come up with this side of heaven. So help us to just rest. Help the worry to drift away. We don't have to worry about the people around us because you've got a plan. We don't have to worry about what we're going to do tomorrow. You are going to figure it out. Help us to just lay it all down and, and be reminded of your goodness. Father, we love you. We praise you for what you're going to do today in this place, Lord. We praise you for those coming to surrender their lives to you and join this church. What an amazing day that today is. Be with us as, as Pastor David brings the rich word. Lord, be with us as our hearts surrender all the things that we think are most important and let you be the most important thing in our lives right now. We love you and praise you. In your name we pray, amen. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail, and there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will still. is not an easy prayer to ask, 
but I pray that you would get into the, the, the place with the Lord where it's not so scary, where it's not so scary to give it all up. Y'all, it's scary. It's absolutely scary. You just don't know what he's going to do, but I can promise you his plan will be better than yours. It will bring you more joy. It will bring you more contentment. It will bring you more peace. That's what we want, right? We want peace this side of heaven. That's what keeps us up at night, is not knowing. But I need you guys to understand, his plan will outdo yours every time. And it's not because he's a, a God of pride and wants to be the hot shot. It's a God that wants your best, your best interest at heart. So we just come together and say these words, even though it's scary. Can you guys just stand with me on this bridge? We all know this one. And let's just cry out this to him. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Beautiful time in worship this morning. Thank you all very much for that. You may be seated and thank you to you for giving of your time this week to come and worship with us again. If you're visiting with us today, we are delighted to have you and we, uh, we hope that you'll fill out your connection card. We promise not to inundate you with snail mail or with email, but we would like a record of your visit so that we can keep you apprised of what's going on in the church. If the kids will come down, it's time for uh, children's bread. And let's see, uh, come on down. Been here, been here now. Hey. Uh, uh, what, three years, five months, three years, six months? And I remember when I came, there were like two kids, right? Two kids. And look at this dose, right? Uno dose. And look now, the children's ministry keeps growing and growing and growing, as does the youth ministry, and we are thankful for that. So you brought the bag this week, huh? Did you pack it yourself? You picked it out? Huh? What? Somebody helped you? Okay. All right. How's everybody on this end? 
Where's your hat today? <laughs> Don't know. Well, you look beautiful with hats or without hats, okay? So you're good. All right, so is this, okay. There we go, we'll do that. Thank you, kind sir. All right, so if you're here today and you know what's going on, this is what we call our children's bread. The kids bring in a bag like this every week. I don't know what's in the bag. They have two rules. They can put anything they want to put in here, nothing living, nothing dead, that's it. And uh, other than that, um, it's Katie bar the door, as I always say. I get to take out what's in the bag and make a spiritual application with it. So let's see today what's in the bag. What is this? Jesus. It's Jesus, but it's not just any Jesus. It's bobblehead Jesus, right? Bobblehead Jesus. Yeah. I need that to put up on my dash with my fuzzy dice. And little dog in the back whose head does the same thing. All right, bobblehead Jesus, bobblehead Jesus, I like that. Let me ask you this, why do you think his head is bobbling? Why does his head do that? Why? Uh, because the factory makers um, make a little um, spring that rotates. Yeah, so there's something technical going on in there. Why do you think it's bobbling, bobbing like that? Huh? Spring. spring, there's a spring in there. This is why I, th why do you think it bobbles? Because I'm moving it, yeah. So y'all are giving highly technical answers. This is why I think it bobbles. I think it bobbles so that we will pay attention to it. Do you know that? I think that's why Jesus' head is bobbling, so we will pay attention to it. You know, sometimes me and you, we get a little bit fidgety, right? And sometimes we get fidgety because we're tired of sitting still, and then sometimes we get fidgety because we want a little bit of attention. Sometimes we want to be seen. Sometimes we want to be heard. Sometimes we want a little attention. I think bobblehead Jesus, yeah, springs are making him bobble because I'm moving it. Sometimes I think Jesus wants a little bit of attention from us. You know that? So when you see bobblehead Jesus and you see his head bobbling, uh, think about that maybe he wants a little bit of attention from me and you. What is one way that we can give attention to Jesus? How might we give attention to Jesus? Praying and just looking at him. Praying and just looking at him, just gazing upon him. How else might we give attention to Jesus? Yes, ma'am. Do you know? To put stuff in your car so it reminds you of him, right? Okay, good, very good. Yes, sir. Read the, Bible. Read the Bible, right? That's a great way of paying attention to Jesus. Anybody else? Listen, there are, yes, sir. Any ideas? Or did you go blank? I do that sometimes. So there, listen, there are five big ways. Yes, sir. Go to church, right? There are five big ways that you pay attention to Jesus. There are a bunch of ways to pay attention to Jesus, but there are five big ways that you pay attention to Jesus that I talk to you, the big folks in here about all the time. And y'all have named some of them. Read your Bible. Pray. Worship. Tithe. Do you know what it means to tithe? You give of your time, your money, your gifts, and your talents, right? And serve other people. In Jesus' name. Not serve other people so you'll get a paycheck. Not serve other people because you think it's the nice thing to do. But serve other people because Jesus taught us to serve. So there are a bunch of ways to pay attention to Jesus. So when you see his head bobble, you remember to pay attention to him. But guess what? Sometimes we don't always see his head bobbling. Sometimes we feel in our heart that it's time to pay attention to Jesus. So be aware that he's always with us, and be aware that he always wants our attention, okay? Now, let's pray together. Let's pray your hands up. Dear God, thank you that you want our attention, because if you didn't want our attention, there would be no way for us to know, because you made us. You are our creator, you are the one who saves us, and you're the one that gives us hope for tomorrow. Thank you for that, and thank you that you keep yourself at the forefront of our mind whether it's a bobblehead Jesus whether it's simply a pull on our heart 
or maybe it's somebody that we see that's in need, help us to love them, to pay attention to them, and to do this because you loved us first. God, I thank you for the kids that are with us today, those that are watching online, and I thank you for those that are unable to be with us today. I ask your blessings upon them all. Bless their homes and their families. Bless their schools and their teachers. And bless this church as we teach them how to follow you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Very good. All right. I need a young lady to bring the bag next week. So your hand first. And whose bobblehead Jesus is this? Huh? Huh? Mine? I get to keep it? Awesome. Yes. All right, so I drive a little gray car, and I drive a little white pickup, both. So when you see them, look for bobblehead Jesus, because he will be there, I guarantee you. All right, it's time for Children's Church. Head on out to the back. There they go with Mr. Sam. Thank you, sir, for bringing that. Very good. All right. Awesome. This is high-quality bobblehead Jesus, too. This is not just any bobblehead Jesus. It's got some weight to it, man. That's awesome. Maybe he needs to go right there. Hey, or maybe he needs to go like this. I'm watching you. At this time, I would like to ask Pat Ahern and Jean Bagwell to come join me down at the front in front of the altar. And anybody that would like to stand them as they take the membership vows of the church, Pat and Jean have uh, been with us in the church for an awfully, awfully long time, and they come now to be official members. So, front and center, gentlemen. Awesome. Very, very good. All right. No trick questions here, right? Kind of going over this a little bit. We're good to go. So, Folks in the church, take hold of your insert like that. In just a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to stand up, and there'll be some things for you to say as well. So, Pat and Jean, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? I do. Do you confess Jesus as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages Nations and races. I do. As a member of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? I will. I will. As a member of Forest Park United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? I will. I will. Very good. And if you'll turn and face the congregation, and congregation, if you would please stand. So church, I ask you, do you as Christ's body of the church reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Amen. Will you nurture these men before you in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example they may be guided to accept God's grace to profess their faith openly and to lead a Christian life? Amen. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these men in your care? We will. Now, members of the household of God, I commend Pat Ahern and Jean Bagwell to your love and to your care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. And Pat and Jean, on behalf of the whole church, it's now my pleasure to welcome you. May you live in grace and peace through the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you all. Love you, brother. You can give them a round of applause. Very good. You may be seated. Beautiful, beautiful time in worship today. Great culmination. And now the sad news. You got to listen to me for a little bit. The sad news, you have to listen to, I don't guess you have to, I guess you could leave. Uh, that would be okay. Oh, st hang around, you're already here. Uh, I guarantee you that um, Mission Barbecue will not run out of barbecue by the time we get done. Um been talking about why Christmas matters year-round and you know people ask all the time why, why do you want to continue to talk about Christmas after Christmas is over well it's not that Christmas is over it's that the celebration of Christmas has come to an end but remembering Christmas is very important to us even as we move on throughout the year 
So we talk about Christmas, we think about Christmas, and we do early Christmas shopping. Last week we found out that there are some people in the church that leave their Christmas decorations up all year round. There are those like my Mima who long before she went to the grave, she would have her Christmas tree and put a garbage bag over it and put it in the back bedroom and then take it off and put it back out, right? So there are all these things that people do with Christmas in mind that Christmas goes away. So we're talking about why Christmas matters year-round, and, and we discovered last week that Christmas is extremely important to us because in his coming, Jesus literally spit, split time into two, right? So we've got B.C., we've got A.D., so we did some very important things for you and for me as we talk about his coming. So we're discovering why it is that it matters in July does Christmas just like it does in December. As I'm doing research for this sermon over the past couple of weeks, uh, I've come across a whole bunch of things that, that talk about the idea of Christmas and uh, come across one of my very favorite authors, Tim Keller. Timothy Keller is a, a Presbyterian minister and uh, a prolific author uh, up in the state of New York. And he had some really good thoughts. And I want to share just a couple of those with you today when he talks about the idea of Christmas and, and how it is that we receive it as Christians. He wrote this, he said, here's why the doctrine of Christmas is unique. On one hand, you've got religions that say God is so eminent in all things that incarnation is normal. So, so what, let me just stop right there and talk for a minute. When he talks about eminence and he talks about um, incarnation, he's talking about this idea that, that God is everywhere and can do all things, omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotent, right? All of these things that we can do. And there are some religions that say that that is so full that, that God truly is in everything. And, and he gives a couple of examples of that. He says, if you're a Buddhist or you're Hindu, God is imminent in everything. Then he goes on to say, on the other hand, religions like Islam and Judaism say that God is so transcendent over all things that incarnation is impossible. In other words, God cannot be put into a box of any kind, which kind of itself presents a problem. Because if God is all-powerful, which we know he is, to say that he can't do something presents a problem, right? He goes on a little bit further. And he begins to talk about Christianity. He says, but Christianity is in itself unique. It doesn't say that incarnation is normal. But it doesn't say that incarnation is impossible. It, said as God, it says that God is so eminent that it is possible, but he is so transcendent that the incarnation of God in the person of Jesus Christ is a history-altering, life-transforming, paradigm-shattering event. Christmas is not just frankly doctrinal, it's also boldly historical. So that's why the coming of Christ, that's why Jesus coming in the form of a human being splits time into two. Okay, it's not something just doctrinal inside of Christianity. It's truly historical, and because it is truly historical, it is time dividing. It's pretty powerful when you stop and think about it. It literally says that the God who gave you life and me life, the God who has given us hope and forgiveness and a second chance, is the same God who created us. And that he's done these very important things, not by speaking a word and making it happen, but by taking on our form and coming here and walking a mile in our moccasins. That's pretty powerful. So Christmas matters year-round because of who Jesus is and what God did through 
Jesus. And, and his coming does some very special things for us that make us know that Christmas is important in April just like it is in December. Now, I, I know this because I did this in the early service. I know that, that in my wallet, I've got $13. That's amazing. Because very, very seldom do I have cash. It's seldom that I have cash at all. So let's examine a dollar for a minute. I got a five. Listen, I'm walking in high cotton, okay? I've got a five, but let's consider the dollar for a moment. One thin dollar, as the sideshow marker would call that. One thin dollar. This tells me that it is an instrument of currency of the United States of America. It is worth one dollar. It has the power to change from my hand to the hand of someone else in exchange for something or some idea that I feel is worth one dollar. Right? So it within itself in the changing of hands constitutes value of an idea or a product. That's kind of technical. So if I see, I don't know, what can you get for a dollar a piece of bubble gum? <laughs> if I see a piece of bubble gum and I think, man, I got to have that bubble gum, what's it worth to you? And the person that owns it says, well, it's worth a dollar. And I say, hey, I got a dollar. I'll trade you. So instantly that tells me that that piece of bubblegum to me is worth one dollar and to him that piece of bubblegum is worth one dollar because he'll give that bubblegum up for one buck and so it happens I've got the bubblegum I'm happy because I think that bubble gum is worth a dollar. I've ascribed a dollar's worth of value to that bubble gum. And the guy that gave it to me, the guy that sold it to me, has done the same thing. Pretty simple when you talk about value. Pretty simple when you talk about that. Then, then, we got this. This is my Robertson Banking Company debit card. Is it worth a dollar? Intrinsically, no. I mean, it probably cost maybe 25 cents to make this. So it's not even worth a dollar. But man, it represents something, doesn't it? Well, somebody's might represent something. <laughs> but it, it represents more than one of these. Because in this, even though there's no intrinsic value, I can give it to somebody. And I can say, I want that thing or that idea that you've got. And you run this through your computer, and it's going to give you many of these. Because that idea or that thing that you have is worth many of those to me. And I want you to take those from me and give me your thing or your idea. Because it's valuable to me. And then there are those things that move from the negotiable to the non-negotiable, right? This pretty simple notebook, and it's kind of ratty. Um, it's coming apart. It's all kind of busted up. You can get these all day at Office Depot or off Amazon or Walmart for whatever they cost. But not this one, because this one is mine. All right. Now, if I lost it, my name wasn't inside of it, didn't have anything in there that told you that it was mine, you would probably look at it and throw it in the garbage. Because not only is the outside ripped, but the little pages that hold the stuff that has my sermon, it, they're ripped inside of there too. However, to me, this means something. It's not just a notebook. It has intrinsic value to me that is non-negotiable. And I'm not going to tell you what that is. 
But I will tell you, it's important to me. It's important enough to me that I'm not going to give it away. And that if I lose it, and I find you have thrown it in the garbage, I'm going to be upset. Not that it's your responsibility to hold on what to I, the, the things that I lose. But there's this idea of value that, that can be negotiated that can be traded, and then there's this idea of value that's intrinsic, that can't be negotiated, that doesn't make sense to anyone else. It's like collecting baseball cards. Well, that baseball card is worth $5,000. How do you know it's worth $5,000? Well, because this magazine right here that values baseball cards says it's worth $5,000. Okay, we'll sell it for $5,000. Well, I can't find anybody that wants it. Is it really worth $5,000? Who knows? It's not until you find somebody that wants it. Value. Redemption. Trading. It means something. The Gospel of Luke conveys that message to us. If you have your Bibles today, turn to the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 2, verses 22 down through, oh, I don't know, until I stop reading. How about that? The Gospel of Luke begins to tell us about value in a, an indirect way. You'll, you'll get the idea. Talking about why Christmas matters year-round. We see something happen in Luke chapter 2 that's very important. And what we're going to read is going to tell us why it's important. Luke chapter 2 verse 22 starts out like this. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. So let me stop right there and tell you, in that instance... We are told why this is important. It's important and it's conveyed in a number of ways. It talks about on the eighth day. Why is the eighth day important? The eighth day is important because his mother, Mary, was considered unclean for seven days after she gave birth. So on the eighth day, when she is clean, she can go into the temple area. So on the eighth day, because Jesus is the firstborn male, they are to go in... And because they believe in God through the law of the Jews, the law of Moses, they are to practice some certain things. Chief among them, circumcision. The child is to be circumcised because that is a mark of the covenant. Secondly, they're, they're to offer a couple of birds in sacrifice. So they get caught up in that and they go to do these things. And in doing so, we, we see a couple of things of, of value. They value what the law of the religion they practice says, and, and they value Jesus in a particular way. Verse 25 says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had uh, seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was the custom of the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all nations, a light, a revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There also was a prophet, Anna, 
the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. There's value in that dollar bill and there's value in the debit card because it can be redeemed for many dollars. But the thing that we learn about value and about redemption as we read this scripture is that in Jesus' time, people were valued in very different ways. In Jesus' time, it didn't make any difference if you were the firstborn female. Not important. Because women were valued differently than men. It didn't matter if you were the second-born male, because only the first-born male is the one who was going to be heir to your father's stuff. It didn't matter if you were a child, because child, children were less than. That's why Jesus says, suffer the little children and let them come unto me. And why his, his disciples get upset when he says that, because children, they weren't very valuable. They weren't worth much. They're, there's not much worth in redeeming them. People at Jesus, in Jesus' time were valued by society based on what they could do for society. And people in Jesus' time were valued on the basis of their race, on the basis of who their mama and their daddy was, uh, uh, based on the value of, of what they possessed and what they could bring into the economy. And you might be thinking, hmm, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And sadly, that's true. If you listen to the world. But something happened. Something happened that predated Jesus going to the temple on that eighth day. Something happened eight days earlier that split time into two that makes Christmas, which is what happened eight days earlier, matter to us all year round because when Jesus came, when God came incarnate in the person of Jesus, he changed the way we value people. He changed the way you're valued, and he changed the way I'm valued forever and ever because the world tells us that we are valued based on its system of valuation. The world in Jesus' time, and to a degree, our time, still tells us that we are redeemable for what we are worth to another human, for what we are worth to the economy and to this society. But Christmas, Christmas says our value is not determined by the world. Christmas says our value is determined by God, by what we're worth to him. And Christmas is what ushers in the time that's going to tell us that God who gave us creation says that we are worth his own life. Because as we have said ad nauseum since the beginning of Advent, without Christmas, there would be no Easter. That is why Christmas splits time into two. That is why your value and my value is no longer determined by this world. That is why your value and my value is determined by God himself. And he has said, you are so valuable that I'm going to make myself incarnate in a human body just 
like yours. And furthermore, I'm going to give up that life so that you don't have to worry about redemption anymore. So that you don't have to worry about your worldly value anymore. I'm going to give up that which is precious to me so that there's no more need for two doves or a couple of pigeons. So that there's no more need for an unblemished lamb once a year. Because I'm going to give up the perfect lamb that came into this world on Christmas. And that, friends, is why Christmas matters in November, just like it does in December. Because Christmas brings to me and you value and redemption that we can never know without it. I don't know what you're struggling with. I know what some of you are struggling with. But I don't know what you're all struggling with. Maybe you're not struggling. Maybe this is a time of great blessing in your life. But I know that there are some of you that are indeed struggling with the concept of who you are and what you're worth. There are some of you that are struggling with things that have happened to you since you've been alive on this earth. There are some of you that are struggling with with things that, that you just know are unjust, and they probably are. But I want you to know that there's a book in the Bible called Ecclesiastes, and it's way in the, in the, back in the Old Testament. And, and in that book, it says there's nothing new under the sun. So it doesn't matter what you're struggling with. It ain't new. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with or how unique you think it is to your life. It ain't unique. Somebody else has struggled with that. And in that truth, you find hope. You find hope because in that struggle and in that truth, there's someone else who can help you. In that struggle and in that truth, there is value. I'm not saying that there's value in the unjust things that have been done to you or perpetrated against you. But I am telling you, that holding on to those things and trying to cover those things with your own strength is only going to lead to pain. Sharing that burden with others makes all the difference in the world. And because there's nothing new under the sun, I guarantee you that you can find somebody who's suffered maybe not the same thing, but they've suffered in the same manner. Jesus knows and Jesus understands because he put on this suit of meat and he came and he suffered just the way you're suffering. If he didn't, then the saying that that he's been tempted just as we're tempted isn't true. For me and for you, understanding that value and redemption take on a different tone because of Christmas is tantamount into understanding and appreciating why Christmas matters in June just like it does in December. Pray with me. It's hard to understand and appreciate that truth, Father. Because for me and for you, there are difficulties that we face that we're just certain that you, Father, aren't going to understand. And typically, we know that's not true, but man, it can get dark and it can seem hopeless. But you, you give us hope. You give us hope in many ways, but one of the ways that you give us the most hope is because through Jesus, you tell us how much we are valued. 
and through Jesus, you redeem us according to that value. So whatever it is that we're struggling with today, let us understand that you have spoken unequivocally into this time and space continuum. And you, by your own actions, through your son Jesus, have spoken with certainty about our value. And you have offered us redemption. So now, Lord, let us surrender those things that hold us back and hold us down. Let us be willing to share those things that um, certainly feel like our own and no one else's and that no one could understand. Let us share those things because there is nothing new under the sun. And now, Lord, as we do this, help us to do so with a thankful heart and let us surrender to you in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, the altar is open. If you need to come forward and pray, please feel free to do so. I'll be happy to meet you here or just leave you alone and let you pray. If you're struggling, I think I might cry because his head came off. Oh, if you've just dropped your bobblehead Jesus and you're relatively certain that you're going to cry in front of everybody. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I thought I was going to have to take him and wash him in the pool of Siloam. The altar is open. If you need to come forward and pray, please feel free to do so. If not, remain in prayer where you are and I'll come and pronounce a benediction in just a few moments. Would you stand for the benediction, please? Thank you again for being with us today. And now receive this benediction. Move into the world to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. To be exactly what I challenge the children to be. To be his place. To give him your attention. Do this with the love of God. With the peace of Christ. And with the power of the Holy Spirit moving you forward. In his name, amen. Thank you for coming.